response video to Isla Day Guy. Yeah, what the hell. On value, so I'll probably put this on Vlogger Dome on the value subject. Even though it's probably going to be a longish video and it's on YouTube, but anyway. And I'll post below the premise text that I'm going to go over here of, um, you know, a logical argument, the framework of a logical argument, um, demonstrating beyond reasonable contention a theory of value, something like that. Um, establishing that it exists um, beyond reasonable doubt as a concept, value as a thing, as an entity, as a legitimate word in our vocabulary, indicating that there is a quality, a quanta of quality that is being exchanged through our interactions in the universe. By us experiencing consciousness, we are creating value. Um, anyway, and so some of that argument's in here, and um, so anyway, I'd be appreciate if you want to modify a sentence or a paragraph or something to post it in the comments, and um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. I mean, he's inviting the conversation, so I'll participate, but um, yeah, uh, I, I don't accept the snake pilskinist definition of um, uh, when we have to accept something as subjective. Um, the fact that somebody, two people can have different opinions because neither opinion is beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't change the fact that the value itself could be objective. And it's just that both descriptions are inadequate. They're just not perfect enough. So one can't rule out the other um, because of their imperfection um, as statements. But this idea that the truth is something that can be reasonably perceived differently, I'm going to argue, is false. It, can't, it can only be reasonably perceived differently if it's based on some flawed understanding, a brokenness in the logic. So, um, yeah, so it's only when we have a lack of information or a lack of authority, qualification, um, a lack of evidence for an argument that it could hold true. Um, but um, the truth isn't subjective. There's a fact to our existence. There's statements of facts, and they're facts. They're true or false. And um, I don't think there is any reasonable description in existence right now that I've ever heard explaining how you can reasonably negate the fact of our conscious experience. Certainly my individual conscious experience, you can't negate it with some sort of argument. I haven't heard any argument that negates it, where it makes me doubt the fact that I could feel better or I could feel worse than I feel right now. And that feeling better would be preferable, would be, there would be an obligation if the two choices existed and there was an equal penalty for choosing either one that the rational and logical thing to do would be to choose the preferable one, the one where I benefit in terms of my conscious welfare. It's just an absolute fact. It's a statement of fact that you wouldn't squander my discomfort. You wouldn't waste it. That would be immoral. It would be stupid. It would be retarded. It would be illogical. It would be wrong. And the right thing to do would be not to squander it. Just That's a fact. I believe that's a truth of reality, a not reasonably contended fact of our existence. So anyway, now I've done this, I've you know, negated the whole point of attempting to write this out in statements. But like I said, there, my statements could use some work, they're just rough drafts. So anyway, the established premise is the universe is composed of energetic substance confined by crude physical laws and properties and was not created by anything reasonably called intelligent. So I'm just making the argument, no matrices, no bullshit, no super purposes, it's just energy uh, coalescing into matter, and that the matter arranges, coalesces into these complex arrangements because it's filtered by environmental circumstances into machines that have tools, and the, one of the tools we have is this cognitive ability and this sensation ability to motivate us and to guide us to do this replicating thing. Uh, obviously we can put it to different um, purposes 
as we have done, like flying to the moon and other things that don't have direct um, um, gratifications, you know, for our individual genetic, genetic code, um, but that we have made purposeful through our projections of value. So, all right. Long story short is, yeah, let's stay confined to that reality. If you're going to say God done it or some other mystery force exists or the intelligence is built into the structure or there's some other kind of bullshit theory, then, yeah, let's not bother having a conversation. Okay, I want to deal with a physical universe that doesn't have a purpose, doesn't have a brain, doesn't have a mission statement. It's just a game board and not written on it as any way to play the game beyond the fact that pieces move. But there is no goal, there is no win, there's just play. Anyway, morality describes the obligation to maximize utilization of valuable commodities. So, morality is just another way of saying how, how are you going to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a statement defining what the appropriate use of a commodity, something of value, is interchanged or used or implicated or, you know, how it's affected. So morality is not a word about a dogma. It's about what is the right thing to do. So if you know there's a one in five chance of snake eyes coming up, and snake eyes is bad, let's say, we've established that as a premise, and you have two sets of dice, and one set of dice, snake eyes, comes up one in five, and the other set, <coughs> snake eyes, comes in one in ten, you have a moral obligation to roll the one in ten dice, not the one in five dice, because it more it, it more maximizes utilization of the value commodity. It provides greater potential for positive outcome. So that's the morality, is you have an obligation when logic dictates to do what the logic basically says, which is don't, well, it says it here in the second part of the sentence, or the obligation to minimize the waste of value. So once we've established something has value, that it's precious, um, morality is the obligation not to waste the precious, not to squander it, not to destroy it, unnecessarily, not to harm, you know, the, the, all, the, all the negative impact things you could do to something that you would define as precious, valuable. You don't want, you want to get the most you possibly can out of its play. So let's say it was a chess strategy. There would be a strategy that had, that was the most perfect. And that would be your obligation to go with the most perfect strategy. Now obviously this game's a lot more complicated than chess the game we're playing. Um, so you can almost equate it to basketball. And there's like, through the whole two hours of the game, there's lots of scenarios you could play out where if you let the best player shoot the first five baskets, he might score all five, but he might get tired because he had to do a lot of running. So it might be better if the other guy shot the first five, some other player, and you save the, the best guy for later when all the other players are tired and he'll score 10 out of 10 later, something like that. So it's hard to know when the right time is to take your shot, when the, how to maximize your impact. I mean, if I go back in time, there's lots of ways I could interfere in history, but there would be a more perfect way to interfere, to get the most out of my whatever I had. If I had two hours to fuck around with history, there would be a, a truth to the fact that this would be the best way to screw up history, you know, to change it in the best way in terms of the long-term, absolute, final um, effect of my changes. So it's almost like the movie Groundhog Day, where if you had enough time to replay the same day, you could basically make the day perfect, and you could maximize what you could draw out of the day. All right. Effect on the longest-term net outcome is what must be effectively assessed. So this is what makes it difficult. Because, yeah, we have to know what the million, trillion year forecast, what, what the impact is for the longest term, the most complete impact, not the narrowest, like, okay, the implications of, I just dropped that screwdriver. Now, maybe I'll lose it now. 
and never be able to use it again. And I'll need to fix something. I won't have the screwdriver. And I'll use something else and I'll break it. And then somebody will get mad at me and they'll kill me. So there could be a whole bunch of implications because that screwdriver fell. And so I wouldn't know them because they're long term. In the short term, it just seems, oh, so what? A screwdriver fell. So in the short term, it says it's not much of an event. But it could be a big event in the long term. And that's what's always obviously a little bit difficult to assess in the circumstance we're in because of all these subtleties and all these other arguments that can be made. So the argument isn't that value doesn't exist for me. The argument is that value is difficult to assess. But it is there to be assessed. It's just that we can't know all the details. It's like knowing, it's like dissecting a microbe. You can know a lot, but you can't know it all. Um, but I'm going to further argue that what we need to know about value to make statements about ought um, is sufficient. We have enough information to make reliable ought statements about what is morally appropriate behavior, what is likely to produce a positive outcome. We have those generalities. We have plenty of information to make those statements. You know, you ought not you know, get drunk and drive. We know that there's no good potential likely in that event. It's a million to one kind of chance for anything good to happen. And there's a high probability of something very bad happening. So the logical moral statement is very easy to compose. All right. Probabilities define logical or moral imperatives. So now we're back to my probability word. Um, there's no such thing as probabilities and inevitabilities, but again, we can, we can assess what variables are missing in an equation. And we can understand the relevance or importance of those missing variables. So, like I said, we do know certain probabilities. And so certain events like drinking and driving, certain other things, we know that it's all negative potential and no positive potential or very little positive potential and those we can put in the categories of these extremes are really easy to establish a moral imperative, a, a logical imperative. It's not difficult to establish the right and wrongness of a particular defined act because the odds of um, something good happening are so slim and the odds of something bad happening or being the implication is so high. So they're really easy statements to make. Don't be a serial killer. Not likely to be a good idea. Not likely to be an efficient use of your energy. Um, anyway. Alright, so beyond reasonable doubt has to be the only standard we got. It's the highest standard we have right now because we don't have absolute proof. I mean, it would be nice to have beyond absolute proof. <laughs> you know, it's the standard. Um, whatever. I mean, we just don't have it. We, we, all we can do is go based on with the evidence we have and reasonable interpretation of it. And the second standard for reasonable interpretation would be beyond reasonable contention or evasion. So there's two parts to that. This idea that somebody doesn't have any counter-argument that even comes close to putting a dent in the statement, the moral statement. And the other part of it is this evasion thing, because a lot of people just want to evade making decisions. They don't like the implications of a truth, they'll just make an excuse to say, I don't have enough information, I can't make a solid enough judgment, I, I, I'm, I'm confused. Well, that's just evasion, and that's, that's as big a crime as the crime itself, right? I mean, if you don't convict the murderer, because you evade responsibility, um, evade your responsibility to make a decision one way or the other um, and try to just um, avoid decision you're essentially making a decision and you're sticking society with a liability because you were unwilling to um, deal with the fact that you do have to make these statements you do have to make these rules you do have to have this impact and this influence you do have to exercise your judgment or your judgment is meaningless and useless and so evasion is not an answer um, and it can be unreasonable sometimes evasion is unreasonable sometimes you just have to act 
not acting is acting and it's acting very negatively. Um, random is not a solution. The difference between recognized real value and mentally contrived projections of value. So this one's a real easy one too, and it's it's the one that gets caught up in these arguments that people make about subjectivity, because they don't understand that there's two parts of this game we're playing. We are psychologies that have likes and dislikes and preferences and desires and fears. And then we also are this intellect can, that can logically understand things. And so even though I might be bigoted against snakes, I could logically know that snakes aren't any different than any other animal. They're just trying to eke out their existence, and so I wouldn't vote against snakes. Even though I don't like them, I wouldn't vote against them. You get it? Because I would know better. So, um, I'm going to argue, I, I will, part of the argument I'm making here is that um, real value is in the sentient, that created by the sentient, and projected value is all the stuff the sentient says it likes or wants. Okay, so when you say I want or I like, that usually is bullshit, unless you're saying it from some sort of logical um, understanding, some recognition of what's in the world and it actually having a, a place. So that's when you're being objective, when you're detaching yourself from your subjective attachments, preferences, prejudices, conditioning, and you're just speaking about what you recognize in terms of function as a viewer, not a player. So those are two different things. And you got to understand those two roles you can play. So I'll, I'll say this again because it's an important sentence. The difference between recognized real value, recognized, that means it's in the world and we just recognize its real value, and mentally contrived projections of value. So the things that are expressions of our desire, like uh, the value of a particular kind of food, a uh, particular sex partner, you know, attractiveness. I even say this, aesthetics, you know, jump down. Aesthetics is a projection of value, not a recognition of value. When you, when you think something's beautiful, you're creating, you're projecting. You're not, you're not recognizing the real value. You're creating a sense of value in your own head. Um, and it has no meaning as a definition of value. Alright. Uh, to be value relevant, something must affect the experiential welfare of a feeling entity. Increase or decrease comfort. So it's pretty straightforward. Values created by feeling things. Their experiences generate a quantity of value. So if you're enduring smallpox every five minutes or so, or every ten minutes, or every half hour, you create a ball of value negative crap. Suffering. that just has a weight. It has a mass of valueness to it. And um, it can be appreciated. Whether we can exactly quantify it is an, a subject to argument, and I think that's true. It's difficult to exactly quantify exactly how much negative dollars that is. Five negative dollars, ten negative dollars, whatever. But we know it's an amount of negative. And there's certain positives that will have no power to compensate for that negative. So it's just figuring out the exchange rates between these value states. Um, but ultimately I'm going to argue that all the value states are negative. So in a sense you can you have no hope of ever compensating for powerfully negative experiences people experience because you can never generate anything of real value to compensate for it. And all there can be is a projection of value, a notion of value based on some I will accomplish something in the future and that accomplishment will justify the suffering I endured, I created, I let loose into the universe. Oh, man, I'm so tired. Anyway, extremes are easily quant uh, qualified, quantified, value-weighted, and equated. 
So obviously, yeah, the extremes are easy to do. So we know that smallpox for a half an hour wouldn't be worth, like say if you get an extra sprinkle, just a little tiny sprinkly thing on top of your cupcake. We know that there's no way if you went to the store to buy a little extra sprinkle to put on your cupcake and it cost one person having smallpox for an hour, there's no way you, you, you buy that sprinkle. It's just too expensive. So these extremes are really easy to establish the moral imperative the logical imperative. You have a logical imperative not to squander or waste the suffering for something as useless and frivolous and trivial as a sprinkle on the cupcake. All right. The existence of sentience creates value. I mean, it seems like such an obvious statement, but I mean, it's one that's going to have to be established through even more argument that's here than here, but it just is the truth. Okay, the existence of sentience creates value. As soon as there's something alive, feeling, it doesn't even have to be alive, but anything feeling, creating feeling sensations, it's creating value. It now has a welfare. It can feel better or it can feel worse. And that's the game of value. You have a logical imperative to make things feel better and a logical imperative not to make things feel worse. In net, again, it's the net equation. When the whole thing is played out, how much did dropping that screwdriver, how much suffering in the world was created because it dropped, and how much would not have been created if it hadn't dropped? And that'll be the question whether I had a moral obligation to prevent it from falling. The existence of sentience, oh, I already did that, creates value. Conscious experiences produce a value state. So consciousness is the creator of value. And yeah, it just seems obvious. Okay. So anyway, and then my hypothesis or theory would be that all conscious states are relative degrees of a negative state. But there is no true positive that all you can do is elevate something state from a less positive state to a more a less I mean a more negative state to a less negative state and that's all we do in our existence is migrate ourselves from you know more less negative to to more negative or more negative to less negative and that's all we can accomplish and so it's totally a zero sum game and it just totally can't be played um, to a profit it can only be played to a loss um, because you have to create the negative state before you can have any positive state. You have to make the mess before you can clean up the mess. And that isn't fundamentally makes it broken. Because you have to break it to fix it. We have to break it by existing, by making us vulnerable, by creating harm. And now we can e extract ourselves from harm and call that victory. But it's not really a victory. We're just getting ourselves out of the hole that we were thrown in, in terms of existing. So anyway, that's another argument, separate from the existence of value and morality. So I will keep that separate, but I'm just saying that's, ultimately that does play a key role in understanding um, this quanta of value and the fact that it is very mathematical and it does have... Um, a substance that can be understood and that we can pretty much, if we really work at it, quantify it. We can quantify our experiential state and understand it to be, you know, negative one dollar versus negative five dollars versus negative ten dollars versus negative a million dollars. And we can do a lot of that. We can certainly fit things into ranges and we can understand that to take myself from a negative five dollar to a negative one dollar I can't do that I can't justify taking somebody else from negative fifty dollars to negative five hundred dollars that that would be a bad value exchange therefore illogical therefore immoral yeah probably enough of a video 
So anyway, um, I'll try to narrow it down, even you know, get it quicker and more concise. But anyway, that's the first shot at it anyway. And we'll see if we can tighten the language up a little bit. So we'll see where we go from here. Such.